Well, hello. It's another great evening here at 153greatfish.website. <clears throat> we have a great lesson tonight on the one world currency that's arriving. And this is information that every Christian needs to know. If you can, you should forward this video to all of your friends because this is going to take some great discipline to avoid what is arriving. Let's begin with prayer. Jesus, we love you, Lord. We praise you, mighty God. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. God, I pray that you just help all of us know how to operate in these next few months. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to the PowerPoint and talk about this important topic. One world currency is arriving, and you were asking yourself, what is it? And I'm going to talk about that here tonight. So let's begin. Here's our outline. I want to talk about a non-government controlled currency and I want to compare it to gold. This currency is known as crypto and we're going to talk about that and hopefully uh, if you will stick with this you'll learn something and you'll be on the watch for it. Make sure you Google it, get some education, understand how it's going to affect you. I want to talk about the technology behind the crypto uh, currency. It's the blockchain database. This is a distributed ledger technology Everybody's going to have to get some idea about what this means because it's going to affect your mobile phone, it's going to affect your laptop, it's going to affect your jump drive, it's going to affect the cloud if you know what those things mean. There still will be paper currency for a while, don't worry. Uh, however, uh, it's going to be less and less uh, as we see that governments are going, going to go completely to cryptocurrency. The key technology company that's going to be behind this currency is IBM. IBM is one of the leaders in banking technology. In fact, it is the leader in banking technology. And that's mostly what they concentrate on. Cryptocurrency in banking fees. We're going to talk about what's going to happen, why people will adopt cryptocurrency, and why they already are because of banking fees. We're going to talk about digital wallets, the privacy key. Remember, the privacy key, it is a number and you're going to need to know all about the privacy key. Did I say it enough times? Privacy key. And then anonymity and money changers, why cryptocurrency is no different than any other currency. It needs money changers. The issue is anonymity, and we're going to talk about that. And then buying and selling. What's going to be coming is a UN-based cryptocurrency. Why? Because it requires no central government. And there's lots of players out there who want to see this happen. So let's begin. Gold is a physical standard. In 1934, 1933, 1934, the price of gold was fixed by uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, during the uh, recession, Great Depression, to stabilize the economy. People were hoarding gold, and of course, because our currency was backed by gold, uh, it was causing a problem. They could not use monetary policy to inflate our way out of the depression. Remember, what governments do to, to exercise monetary policy is they print money, and this is a form of taxation without uh, authorization from, from, uh, from Congress. For example, today, the, uh, the, the public debt under Barack Obama has doubled from $10 trillion to $20 trillion in just eight short years. How did he do this without raising taxes? They did it by printing money and putting it in circulation. So let's say, for example, that you were buying a dozen eggs back in uh, 2008 and you paid a dollar a dozen for them. By printing money, what they did is they, they doubled the amount of dollars that would be chasing those dozen eggs. And so actually the price of those eggs goes up from a dollar to two dollars uh, a dozen. And that's really what inflation does, printing money monetary policy. It allows currency to be spent by the government. It's taxation. It's really not anything other than that without getting the approval from the people. Now, the gold standard was removed in 1971 by Richard Nixon to do the same thing, to allow currency to float, to give uh, governments uh, the ability to use monetary policy to inflate economies, to make them grow, and to focus public money towards certain sectors of the economy, like health care. That's what's going on right now. Government here in the United States is focusing monetary policy, printing dollars towards health care. They are not raising that money through taxes. They are simply standing at the Xerox machine, printing paper money. 
Now, gold is physical and it needs storage. It's also a national currency. In fact, it's an international currency. It's been used even during the Holocaust, where people were buying their way out of, uh, uh, out of turmoil with gold and jewels, etc. It does fluctuate in price. You can always check out the price of gold on monix.com. And you buy gold on an exchange, just like you would say buy uh, euro dollars or you would buy uh, rubles or you'd buy any currency. Gold is a commodity that is purchased on an exchange. However, gold is now obsolete. There will always be a value for gold because it's, it's finite. There's only so much mined per year. You can only make so much of it. There's only so much around the world. However, it's obsolete as a medium of exchange. People that are putting gold in their safe at their home, that's a, that was a good strategy. However, you will need to have some cryptocurrency because gold will not be used as a medium of exchange during economic hard times. And that was proven up here in 1933 and 34 by FDR. Gold will be controlled. It made it, the, FDR made it illegal to sell gold or to hold it. And they prosecuted many people. They were able to track them. And this is the problem with gold is that it makes you traceable, just like an American bank account. You do not have anonymity with an American bank account. Everybody has an account number. Everybody has to tie it to their social security number. There is no anonymity for corporations or for individuals. Now, monetary policy is printing money using inflation to get the economies moving. That's what's been going on since the 2008 crash. They've doubled the amount of money that they have raised through taxes. They've borrowed it. And so the national debt is now 20 trillion, but they're also printing money. And that's what the Federal Reserve does. And the Federal Reserve and the federal government are in cahoots to control monetary policy. So when you talk about the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve, and the national government, they are all working together to tax and inflate our way out of economic problems. So the government spends more than it takes in. Okay? <laughs> Nobody else gets to do that. But they're able to do that because they can borrow and because they stand at the Xerox machine and print. Let's talk about cryptocurrency now. There we go. And the number one cryptocurrency today is a currency called Bitcoin. Many of you have heard about it. And all cryptocurrencies will work according to the principles of Bitcoin. That's why we're going to talk about it today. And, uh, but the Bitcoin will not be the international currency that's arising from the UN. It will be the UN's own version of Bitcoin. And there's going to be some key differences. So that's really why I'm trying to educate you to what's coming on this new currency. First of all, cryptocurrency is actually software. It's a virtual standard. And the price and the quantity today of Bitcoin is not controlled by a central government. Imagine any government not allowing the currency to be controlled by them. That means that they can't use inflation and borrowing to... Uh, 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 control the economies and to spend money they didn't tax the people for. This is a big problem. In fact, governments now recognize that Bitcoin is a threat to their sovereignty. And it's an international currency. It's crypto. Crypto simply means it's virtual, it's code, it's encrypted. And the thing about cryptocurrency is that it's peer-to-peer. -peer. In other words, there is no central computer today like there is in most, in, in most banks. Every bank, including NASDAQ, including uh, JP Morgan, uh, all the banks in the United States have a centralized computer that uh, take uh, track and control every transaction in North America and the world. And the U.S. dollar is, in fact, the world currency today. But a peer-to-peer -peer network using a cryptocurrency has no central government control. This means that every computer on the Internet, meaning a mobile phone, a desktop computer, is connected to each other and the ledger the ledger that keeps track of all those transactions is on each of the nodes in other words uh, everybody has a copy of the ledger not a central bank but everybody who has a computer and the cell phones are extremely powerful today anybody that's going to use cryptocurrency uh, like Bitcoin uh, will have a copy of that distributed ledger so we need to understand what that distributed ledger is who invented it which is very mysterious finally Cryptocurrency is proof of work. In other words, they have designed it such that there is always a notary public signature on every transaction. Okay, And so that means that you can trust it. It has total trust, and it works. The guys that invented this knew what they were doing. So you can trust crypto. You can trust transactions between nodes on a peer-to-peer -peer network 
you can trust the fact that this Bitcoin that I spent is what you received, that there is no duplication. In other words, using money strategies like time delays to spend money twice. Cryptocurrency cannot be spent twice, and that's why it produces this trust thing. So proof of work, that's the, that's the idea behind it. Now, cryptocurrency fluctuates in price, no different than gold does. You can find the price of uh, cryptocurrency at Coindesk.com. And of course, this company is owned by some venture capitalists that are very large and it's international and the elites own these companies. And of course, you buy crypto on an exchange just like you would buy, let's say, uh, shekels. If you were in Jerusalem, you bought shekels and traded your dollars to a money changer. Or uh, when I was in Europe, I was in the Netherlands, I went to a money changer to buy some uh, uh, euros and of course, I exchanged dollars for them. So there is... Uh, virtual exchanges out there, many of them that will change money for you. The problem with the current cryptocurrency, this stuff over here, this Bitcoin, is it eliminates the power of monetary policy. It takes it away from the Federal Reserve, from national governments, from the Treasury. And this is what they are worried about. And so you'll find that many of them are having meetings right now because this is starting to gain critical mass. And I'm going to talk about that, why it threatens governments and what the UN is going to do to stop it. Okay, so here's how cryptocurrency works. First, an internet user goes to an online money changer and buys crypto. So there's lots of cryptos out there. Bitcoin is the biggest one. There's one called uh, Ethereum. There's another one uh, called Litecoin. So you can create a cryptocurrency. Anybody who can write software can create one. And this is what the United Nations is going to do. They're going to actually write software to create a cryptocurrency that everybody will use and the rest of these current cryptocurrencies that are out there are going to be made illegal. Trust me, sovereign governments are not going to allow Bitcoin to exist much longer. It's going to be made illegal, just like they made holding gold illegal, and they can do it. The user is issued a wallet and a privacy key after they buy the currency. That wallet will sit on a jump drive, it sits on your mobile phone, it sits on your laptop. Uh, so wherever you're going to spend money online or at, let's say, a retailer that takes cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, and the privacy key is, is, the, is the main thing. It is a number, okay? But today there is total anonymity with Bitcoin. You, they cannot find out who you are. It's totally anonymous. And this is what has governments upset and regulators, and they're going to change that. That's why this UN currency is going to have a number of a name. Your name will have to be associated with this privacy key. And of course, there's going to have to be some sort of international organization to safeguard uh, privacy and identity. And this is the key that's coming. The privacy key will be associated with a number of a name. The user installs the wallet on a PC, a mobile phone, a jump drive, or even in the cloud. But the, but the big deal is, is that if you lose your privacy key, you have lost your money. It's like burying your, your dollars in the ground or your gold in the ground and forgetting where you buried it. It's sunken treasure. So you will have to have a method, an algorithm, to determine what this privacy key is. It's my belief that it will be somehow related to biometrics. Maybe it will be in, uh, related to your personal DNA. Maybe it will be related, uh, which, which can be derived as a number. Uh, who knows? There will be a scheme where they'll be able to duplicate your privacy key so that you can find your money. If you lose it through a computer crash, you lose your mobile phone, the cloud company goes bankrupt, your jump drive, you lose it, they will have to have an algorithm to help you discover what your privacy key was and uh, because it will be the number will be way too long to remember personally. You just won't be able to remember it, but it will be the number of a name. So the wallets cannot be stolen by hacking. These virtual wallets are secure because of cryptography. They're encrypted with some unique encryption technology. But they can be stolen if somebody steals your privacy key or your device. And so that'll become an issue. And so passwords, uh, multiple levels of passwords, the number of your name, the privacy key will become very important. So the user purchases goods and or currency using the crypto wallet. Now here's what's unique about this. There are no banking fees or credit card fees on transactions. Now think about this. Now I support a missionary in Liberia and uh, Western Union takes approximately, depending upon how much money you, you send, between 11 and 8 percent of the money off the top. But by using Bitcoin, there are no banking fees. 
All my missionary has to do is find a money changer that will change uh, uh, crypto uh, currency into U.S. dollars over there or into Liberian dollars, whatever they use. And this makes Western Union a bad investment. They're going down, folks. So I hope this uh, helps you to understand a little bit about how the cryptocurrency works. And crypto is no different than gold coins. The problem with gold coins is because gold is somewhere around $1,200 an ounce, uh, one ounce of gold, uh, which might be a silver dollar or, or the same weight as a silver dollar, uh, is $1,200. How do you divide that up physically? And that's, that's the problem. You can't divide it up physically. Now, before I <clears throat> do the educational part about uh, distributed ledger or blockchain technology, I just want to give you a few key concepts before you watch the uh, next uh, uh, slide or video on what this stuff is all about. I'm going to talk about the blockchain database, or the video will. <clears throat> There's four key concepts in digital currency or, or Bitcoin that you uh, need to understand. First is that there is encryption. This keeps it safe from tampering and hacking. Second is proof of work. Transactions must be validated with a notary public sort of vehicle certified. And the blockchain database technology has that built in. Third, there must be a network of users who adopt the crypto dollars, the cryptocurrency, or the crypto UN dollars that are coming. And then fourth, a distributed ledger. The blockchain architecture is based on the distributed ledger. Okay, let's just take a few minutes and watch this next video on how this technology works, and then I'll summarize. At a very basic level, Bitcoin is just a digital file or ledger that contains names and balances, and people exchange money by changing this file. When Bob sells Carol a lawnmower for 5.2 bitcoins, Bob's balance goes up by 5.2 and Carol's down by 5.2. There's no gold or government issued money backing these numbers. Bob is only willing to trade his real life lawnmower for a higher number in this digital file because he has faith that other people will also trust the system. So who maintains this ledger and makes sure no one cheats? One goal of bitcoin is to avoid any centralized control so every participant maintains their own copy of the ledger. One surprising consequence of this is that everyone can see everyone else's balances, although the real system only uses account numbers and not names, so there's some level of anonymity. If everyone maintains their own ledger, how are all the ledgers kept in sync as money is transferred? At a basic level, when you want to send money, you simply tell everyone else by broadcasting a message with your account number, the receivers, and the amount. Everyone across the entire world then updates their ledger. As a quick aside, I'm describing how Bitcoin works for power users, people who help maintain the system. You can also just use the system to send and receive money, though, without maintaining a ledger. If sending money is as simple as creating a message with some account numbers, what's to stop a thief, Alice, from spending Bob's money by using his account number? Like a pen and paper check, Bitcoin requires a kind of signature to prove that the sender is the real owner of an account, but it's based on math rather than handwriting. When a new account number is created, it comes along with a private key mathematically linked to that account number. If you've heard of a Bitcoin wallet, these keys are what it holds and are what allow you to create signatures. To create a signature, a private key and the text from a transaction are fed into a special cryptographic function. Another function allows other people to check the signature, making sure it was created by the account owner and that it applies to that specific transaction. Unlike the handwritten version, these signatures can't be copied and reused in the future as they're unique to each transaction. While the mathematical signatures prove who sent a transaction, they can't prove when it was sent, and this turns out to be problematic. In our traditional banking system, if Alice wrote two checks but only had enough money to cover one of them, the bank would pay the first person attempting to cash his check but refuse the second because Alice's account would be empty. So the order of these checks is critical because it determines who should get paid. Unfortunately, order is much harder to determine in Bitcoin, where instead of a single bank, there are individuals all over the world. Network delays might cause transactions to arrive in different orders in different places, and fraudsters could lie about timestamps. Two recipients might both think their transaction is first and ship a product, effectively allowing Alice to spend money twice. Bitcoin prevents this by providing a way for the entire world to decide on transaction order. As new transactions are created, they go into a pool of pending transactions, and from here they'll be sorted into a giant chain that locks in their order. To select which transaction is next, a kind of mathematical lottery is held. Participants select a pending transaction of their choice and begin trying to solve a special problem that will link it to the end of the chain. The first person to find a solution wins and gets to have their transaction selected as next in the chain. So what's this linking problem? It's based on a special function called a cryptographic hash. 
As scary as this sounds, it just mixes up its inputs and spits out a number, but it's special because it's irreversible. There's no easy way to start with an output and then find an input that generates it other than by making lots of guesses. And this is literally what people are doing in Bitcoin, feeding this function random numbers until the output meets certain criteria. Besides a random guess, you also input a transaction from the pending pool in chain, which is where the linking part comes in. So the lottery provides a way for the entire world to decide which transaction is next, but the math behind it also helps ensure everyone agrees about past transactions too. Suppose you're joining the network for the first time and request a copy of the transaction chain to get caught up but receive several different versions, which one should you trust? Ideally, you would trust the one that the majority of people are using, but determining this on the internet is difficult. What would stop a single person from voting millions of times? Bitcoin prevents this by requiring people to solve math problems to vote. This causes each vote to have a cost in computing power, making it unlikely that a single person or group could ever afford to outvote or outcompute the majority of users. The transaction ordering process described before actually provides the voting system. Part of the input to the linking problem is a transaction from the end of a chain, so each guess is effectively a vote for that chain. But how are all the votes tallied? Because the cryptographic hash function has well-defined statistical properties, you can look at any given answer and estimate how many guesses it took to find it, just like estimating how many coin flips it would take to get 100 heads in a row. So the links in a chain not only put transactions in order, but also act as an effective vote tally, making it easy to see which chain most people are using. Finally, how does money get created? Every time someone wins the lottery to pick the next transaction in the chain, new bitcoins are created out of thin air and awarded to their account. Solving these problems is commonly called mining, as this is how money enters the system, but the main purpose of the math is to make sure everyone's ledgers agree. The math simply provides a convenient way to randomly distribute money into the world. In fact, sometime around 2140, no more money will be created and participants will only be paid from fees added on to transactions. I hope this gives you a quick sense for how Bitcoin works. If you'd like a more detailed summary, check out my 22-minute video, How Bitcoin Works Under the Hood. Okay, that might have been confusing, but uh, you'll need to study more and uh, learn as much as you can about this technology. It's going to affect all of us. So, from credit cards to how you interact on the telephone to your laptop to your cell phone, there you'll see that the number will be in your right hand, coming from your forehead to your right hand into your electronic device, or you'll have to put a pin in that'll represent your privacy key. Uh, there's a number in the right hand. Uh, here you'll see it again. Here you'll see how common this is today. Most people, including my 86-year-old mother before she passed away, were using cell phone technology to communicate. Texting, buying things online, whether it be Amazon, etc. Bitcoin is making this possible without central government control, which is why they're going to make it illegal and issue a cryptocurrency that governments can control. So, this tree of money is going to change. So, Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency put into circulation. It still exists. Uh, it, was, it proved the possibility of crypto virtual currency, but no one knows who wrote the code. Whoever wrote the code is anonymous. You're going to find that this is a strange mystery, but I think we'll solve it. Currently, blockchain conferences are springing up everywhere, especially in Washington, D.C. They're being attended by government policymakers, technologists, venture capitalists, bank consortiums, and government employees. Bitcoin is based on blockchain, and that's why you need to understand what that word means. The world elites, I see I spelled that wrong, the elitists are concerned. We know that because the elites fund the Brookings Institution think tank funded by this institution is funded by the wealthiest man in the world and others because they are concerned they will lose control of banking lending monetary policy and they will be at the mercy of the people so that's why bitcoin is not going to last much longer the motive of the bitcoin inventors is similar to those who created stuxnet it was to wrestle control of the world economy away from the united states dollar Remember, the U.S. dollar is the world currency today, based on the Bretton Woods Agreement following uh, World War II. That agreement has kept the United States and its allies in charge of the world economy. So who would have the motive of wrestling that away from them? Not too hard to figure out. Why? Because the U.S. government can pass along inflation. Every time they print money in Washington, it affects everybody around the world because they use U.S. dollars as currency for trading. 
So when our government racks up debt, prints money, it affects Iran, China, Russia, uh, India. So who has the motive for inventing cryptocurrency? And the answer is Bitcoin was most likely designed by the axis of evil, Russia, China, Iran, possibly India called the BRIC countries. It's a Stuxnet gambit. Blockchain can remove sovereignty and hegemony over the world economy. And that's why what's going to happen is that this Bitcoin is going to be obsoleted. They're going to make people be afraid of it. They'll begin to politicize it, make it illegal. And they're going to issue a new crypto virtual currency that's similar to Bitcoin based on the same principles. But it will be based upon a identity model that is not anonymous. You will have to get the number of a name for your privacy key and that will be centrally administered either by national governments through the United Nations, some sort of a standards body like the World Wide Web Consortium, but it's coming just as the internet is now being administered through the United Nations. When the US government gave up sovereignty over internet, internet is what controls the internet, so will virtual currency be controlled by world government. So I'm just letting you know that it's coming. So there we have it. Uh, I hope I didn't scare you, but I wanted you to be aware that this is going to affect your life and that it, anybody who has a mobile phone, and I'm going to grab mine right here. I've got an Android phone, and cryptocurrency is coming, okay? And it's uh, going to be a worldwide currency. U.S. bank consortiums will lead the way with international banks to have the U.N. make this standard the idea was to wrestle control away from using the U.S. dollar, but that's uh, uh, going to be a secondary issue. It's going to be being One able to trade. Dollar equals 90 euro cents. <laughs> My phone's talking to me. Uh, it'll be uh, a technology that it's going to creep up on you. You need to be aware of it. No man will be able to buy or sell without it. God bless you. I hope you enjoyed the, the lesson, and uh, we'll see you next time on another edition of 153greatfish.website.